All right, before we start, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer, and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, what a joy in serving Jesus. We're thankful for each person who has come. As we realize, Jewish people have just completed Yom Kippur, and a very short time, the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the eight-day feast will begin. We're thankful that we could talk about it and the significance that it has certainly to the Jewish people, but also to us. And so as we look at this feast, open our eyes that we might see, our hearts to understand, our ears to hear, and our eyes to see the truth that you have for us. And we will give you the praise and the honor in Christ's name. Amen. So in Leviticus chapter 23, and starting in verse 33, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, grain offering, sacrifice, and drink offerings, everything in its day. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides your vows, besides all your freewill offerings, which you give to the Lord, and on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the full fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first days, there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, bows of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So this gives us the seven feasts, and really it's a debatable thing whether there's eight feasts or not. That's the debate that uh, rabbis still talk about today. And so we have, um, okay. sorry about that, that was my granddaughter. Uh, we have seven feasts, uh, starting with Passover, ending with Tabernacles, they all tell a story. And if you get a chance to review this, you can kind of pause if you're interested. You can pause on the recording and look at all these and check out the scripture verses and see the, uh, the teaching that each one has. If you notice Passover redemption and then sanctification and resurrection, it really tells a story about the program of God for the nation of Israel. And as we come to tabernacles, it's really talking about the regathering, because remember, it is one of three feasts in which the men, according to Deuteronomy 16, 16, and Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Torah, which means it's part of the law, the Torah, uh, very important to observant Jews. And 16, Deuteronomy 16, 16 says, you got for unleavened bread and for the feast of weeks or Pentecost and for tabernacles, you've got to be in Jerusalem. That plays a key role, by the way, when you read the book of Acts or even the Gospels, because there were certain times that Jerusalem was packed with Jewish people who even lived outside of the land because of the law of going to the temple and gathering there. So what we learn from tabernacles from a from a practical point of view as believers is we look forward to God regathering his people, the Jewish people, in the land, returning to them as the Jewish Messiah of Israel, and bringing the messianic kingdom uh, to them as he promised. That's, 
That's where all the debate comes between believers uh, as to the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Uh, we believe at Friends of Israel, the kingdom is a literal kingdom promised to the Jewish people uh, and through the Abrahamic covenant, the land contract that he, that he uh, gave in Genesis 15, and that there will be a regathering and he will return according to Revelation chapter 19 and Zechariah, where his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And so he will usher in tabernacles, the millennial kingdom. So you could freeze this at some future time, look at it, and go through that. Okay, so now my thing is stuck. There we go. Okay, so the last three and the ones that we did two weeks ago, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles today. Uh, it's a pilgrimage festival, as we said. All males had to appear. Uh, and it talks about uh, the wilderness wanderings. The Jewish people have short memories. Does that mean only the Jewish people have short memories? No. <laughs> no, they're just an example of what we all are. We all need to be reminded. Uh, and the children of Israel uh, needed to be reminded. Each of those feasts are holy convocations, and they serve as a reminder uh, in some aspect of who God is and what his program is for his people and the promises, the unconditional promises that he gave. So we have the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the seventh and final observance. We read it in Leviticus 23. It's the last of the religious uh, of convocations of the year. Uh, and it's about booths. Sukkah is the booth uh, that has to be built. And we'll talk about that. Uh, Sukkot is the day of booths or tabernacles. And the theme is really thanksgiving. As I think I mentioned even just in promoting this week that Sukkot is thanksgiving. We invented thanksgiving. Jewish people invented a lot of things. You know, Passover, we invented the sandwich. A lot of people think it was the Earl of Sandwich, but it was really Hillel who lived way before him. Uh, the Earl of Sandwich, and we eat a sandwich at Passover uh, called the Hillel Sandwich, which has two pieces of matzah. It has uh, a, a little um, a horseradish, and since there's no uh, uh, sacrifices, it doesn't have lamb. But when Hillel invented it, it was, it sounds tasty to me, two pieces of unleavened bread, a little bit of lamb, and some bitter herbs. Well, we not only invented the sandwich, we invented devotions. How do I know that? It's not a Christian invention. The Jewish people are to recite each morning uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So, so we do that. And we invented Thanksgiving, Sukkot. God really invented it, a day of remembrance, a day in which we, actually eight days, seven days, and the eighth day added, we remember what God, uh, God supported us, helped us, through the wilderness wanderings. And so this year, it's Friday, September 29th, uh, which is tomorrow, I believe. It is, no, it's, what's the, I'm, I think it is tomorrow, uh, through October 6th. And the last day, or the eighth day, uh, is Hoshana Hoshan, Rabbah, the seventh day of the Jewish holiday of Sukkah. Uh, and that's where Psalm 118 and verse 28, 25 is recited, or is the kind of the theme verse where it says, save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the last day or the eighth day is called in Hebrew, Shimoni Etzret, and uh, that refers to uh, the last day of Sukkot. It is a day that um, is a praise day. A uh, number of psalms are read. Uh, it's, a, it's an add-on date that God gave in the context of Leviticus chapter 23. Those are the verses that we read. So we know that five days after Yom Kippur, if you remember, Rosh Hashanah was the first of Tishrei, the seventh month. Uh, and on that seventh month, three days, three specific holidays or convocations. 
after Rosh Hashanah, five days later, is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and or excuse me, uh, ten days after, and then five days after uh, uh, Yom Kippur, and immediately after Yom Kippur, they start building the Sukkah, uh, is the Feast of Tabernacles, and so we build a Sukkah. The Sukkah is built by observant Jews in their own homes. Uh, whether they have single homes, they'll build it in the backyard. But in Israel, it's very possible. I've seen them. Uh, they have what we would call condos or apartments, high rises. And immediately after Yom Kippur, on the porches, you know, where you have a little porch, we have them here in a, a condo or a townhouse, you'll see a little porch. Some people put little flowers on them. They might put a couple chairs out there. Well, that's where they build their sukkah. Uh, and you could see them throughout Israel. Synagogues will build them. Uh, those people who can't build one will use somebody's um, somebody else's. Uh, but it's got to be at least four foot high. It's got to at least be four foot wide. No more than 30 feet high. It can have... Three, it has to have at least three sides. So it can attach to a building, that's fine, but it needs three sides. And the roof has to be covered with branches so that you can see the stars because the real purpose of Sukkot is to identify with the children of Israel whose all their needs were met while they were uh, in the wilderness wandering for the full 40 years. Uh, God supplied their needs. Uh, their shoes didn't wear out. He gave them manna from heaven, uh, and he was their provider. And so we remember his provision. And it is, of course, the time of uh, bringing in the harvest at this time. So you'll have all kinds of uh, fruit uh, that represents the harvest to decorate, uh, to decorate the sukkah. So, uh, biblically, as we read, they're to gather at the sanctuary. They're to celebrate for seven days. It is to be like a Shabbat. What does that mean, to be like a Shabbat? It is regarded as holy. It is a time where no work is done. It is, as you read Leviticus, it is a time of sacrifice. Sacrifices are done. So, critical to Sukkot is the temple. And of course, we don't have the temple today, so they have to make provisions. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, they're only able to do certain things because without the temple, you're without the priestly system. Without the priestly system, you're without the sacrifices. But another thing that is done, very important, is grabbing a lulav and a netrog. And a lulav uh, is a... Uh, uh, in, in Leviticus, when we read about the palm trees and the willow branches, that is a special, uh, oh, and the willow tr trees as well. It's, it's the idea of waving the, this, the, the uh, lulav, you wave it north, south, east, and west. So it's like a branch that's made up of different uh, tree branches. And also the etrog. The etrog is kind of like a lemon, but it's not the same as a lemon. But the idea there, it's fruit. Uh, it's, it depicts the harvest. And it is, uh, again, a, a praise to God for his provision. Now, how did the, what did the rabbis do even during the temple? And what they did was significant, certainly for themselves, but even during the time of Jesus, Jesus would use what they did uh, during tabernacles and use it for his own teaching. So one of the things that happened was called the water libation. It was performed by a priest, uh, and each morning he collected water, he brought a golden pitcher. There was a whole procession. He poured it uh, on, a, on the great altar. And for seven days, he would do the same thing. Take water from the spring of Gihon, go to the altar, pour it down. Uh, and that pool uh, would, it, 
from the water of Gihon would go trickling into the pool of Siloam. Ah, the pool of Siloam. Um, that pool water in their day was the water that was used whenever they mixed the ashes of the red heifer. Some of you have heard the law of the red heifer. Uh, modern Judaism today, the very Orthodox, uh, are looking for red heifer. They're trying to breed red heifers. Uh, they think they're very close. If you're interested in any of the things regarding the rebuilding of the temple, which uh, very observant Jews believe will happen, we at Friends of Israel believe it will happen. We differ with our Jewish friends in that we believe that that temple, which will start as being a holy temple uh, where there start sacrifices, unfortunately, we believe that according to Matthew 24, verse 15, and uh, we believe that that temple will have an abomination, and that takes place in the in the uh, book of Revelation, where we read about the Antichrist setting up, setting up an image. So all that plays a role in terms of reestablishing the sacrificial system, which we believe will happen, and so do the very observant Jews. Also, that's the same pool, the pool of Siloam, where Jesus uh, sent a blind man to wash in clay, that's the a man said, all I know I was blind and now I see. That water came from the pool of Siloam. So, oops. The next ceremony, very significant, was called the light ceremony. The, if, if you know anything about the temple, I could tell you that it's called Herod's temple. Herod wasn't a very wonderful guy, but Herod was a great builder. And one of the things he built, he, he built Masada, for instance. But one of the things he did is expand the temple. He put a golden face on the temple. He expanded the porch area. Uh, in fact, what's left today is the platform that Herod built. And uh, if you're familiar to the, with the Western Wall, some call it the Wailing Wall, uh, it was... Herod, who extended that porch and where Jewish people pray, is actually the retaining wall uh, closest to where the Holy of Holies would be. So there's no temple. There's the Dome of the Rock. And to the south of the uh, of the Temple Mount is the Alaska Mosque. But this light ceremony during the time of Herod rebuilding that temple and making it larger and increasing the size and putting gold on it. They had four candelabras that were about 75 feet high. And during tabernacles, they would light these menorahs, huge menorahs. And uh, it was so amazing. They didn't have electric, they didn't have uh, lights like we do street lights that go on and off at night. And so when Jerusalem was dark, which it happens obviously at night, they would light these giant menorahs during tabernacles, which would just radiate and reflect on the gold. The light would reflect on the gold and it was just a sight to be seen. Uh, it, as it says in the Mishnah, which is extra biblical writing, he that never seen the joy of the water drawing has never seen life or seen joy. The same thing was said concerning the the Hanukkah menorah, or the sorry, the uh, the tabernacle menorahs that were lit. Music played. Here's an interesting thing. I don't. I, we have a, a a large diverse crowd online, and I can't see your faces because I'm presenting. But I can tell you the number one issue in churches today is music. Uh, everybody has their idea of what worshipful music is. It's usually divided by age. Uh, those people who are older tend to be a little more conservative versus those people that are younger. You decide where you're at. I'm not here to argue about that. But what I can tell you is if you look at how music was played during this time, it is amazing to me that there is a mixture of the kind of instruments that would satisfy 
all age groups. There are harps. Uh, harps, beautiful sound harps make stringed instruments. Uh, there, we, for us, guitars and violins. And there are horns. Uh, you like trumpets? Do you like clarinets? Uh, cymbals. We associate that with drums. Uh, there was dancing. Again, these are the kind of cultural things that kind of frustrate people. Uh, and I, I think God knows that. It's in the word. You have to discern how you're going to appropriate these things. But I will tell you this. To this day, uh, if you attend a Jewish uh, wedding, a bar mitzvah, you will hear music that is joyful. Uh, there's dancing and singing, even for the ultra Orthodox who make sure there's a division between the men and the women. The dancing is with same sexes. So the men dance with the men, the women dance with the women, and they are they are very joyful. Uh, if you ever want to YouTube uh, a Hasidic wedding, you can hear, see the music, see how they, see what goes on. If you've ever been to Israel uh, and gather around the wall, the Western Wall, and there's a bar mitzvah, you, it, you'll catch the idea of how they use music. And so it goes all the way back to these days that God, when He instituted uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, Thanksgiving. How do we thank God? Uh, we thank God in lots of different ways, and certainly music, poetry is some of the ways we do it. So I talked about the lulav and the etrog, the willow branches. Uh, uh, we talked about the march around the altar and reciting Psalm 118. Uh, that would be done for six straight days, and on the seventh day, they marched around the altar seven times. You, the the idea is that rush i mean that's uh tabernacle sukkot involves sacrifices there are no sacrifices so they they the centerpiece is not the altar but it becomes the lulav the etrog there's no candelabra because there's no temple uh there's no water libation because there's no temple and so they it revolves around the other things so Today, booths are built, uh, as I said, at home or in synagogue. Uh, special services are, ha are, are held. There's the waving of the lulav. Uh, it is uh, 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 making sure that you at least, if you don't sleep in it, you at least uh, eat a meal in it. I, I always tell people, I am not into camping. My idea of camping uh, is a holiday inn. Uh, all the DNA in my body uh, was already filled from past generations of camping. I know several of you probably love to camp, be great outdoors, living in a tent. Uh, that's great. Uh, more power to you. I, I did put in some time with my own children and did a little of that, uh, but a little for me was too much. But the, the best I could do is eat a meal in a sukkah uh, in order to identify with our people. And if you ever get a chance, J Jewish people you might know, to be invited uh, to participate in a, in a, inside of a sukkah, I think you would enjoy it a great deal. So if any of you have Jewish friends who celebrate Sukkot, see if you can get an invite. I think you'd have a great a great time. Uh, so we march around uh, the Torah scroll in the synagogue, and that's on Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah is the last day of the feast, and it's an interesting time. Again, if you could ever, if you ever are around a synagogue on Simchat Torah, which will be coming up obviously this year, so you can do it. You could call your neighborhood synagogue. Uh, get the date uh, for it. What happens is you walk into the synagogue. Uh, they open up the ark, uh, and the ark contains several Torah scrolls. A Torah scroll is a scroll that's written, handwritten by a scribe. So if 
if you think about the the Jewish text written by a scribe on parchment and rolled up, it's very expensive. It takes a long time to copy exactly uh, from a previous copy uh, a brand new Torah scroll. It costs thousands and thousands of dollars. So when they open the ark, the the more uh, prosperous the synagogue, the more Torah scrolls in the ark they will have. You can tell if it's a uh, poorer synagogue by the amount of the number of Torah scrolls in the ark. And they'll take that Torah, which is usually decorated. It's covered in some sort of decorative, with usually with the Star of David. It's blue or black or maroon uh, velvet. It will have chimes on it, bells on it. Uh, it is to give a, a, a pleasant tone when it's moved around. Uh, it's to be protected and look beautiful. And so as they take the scroll out, people rise, people come up. The men who have a uh, talit on, prayer shawls, will kiss their, put their uh, fringes upon the Torah scroll and then kiss it. Uh, why? Because of the love of the word, loving the word of God. The rules around uh, how we handle God's word, it's amazing because most Jewish people don't read the Torah. They won't read it. They might read it when they're at synagogue for an event, but you find very few Jewish people, comparatively, who are engaged with the scripture unless it's at a synagogue. On the other hand, the value of God's word is very high. It is holy. Uh, so if you dropped, if, if you tripped and fell with the Torah scroll, you'd have to fast for 40 days. Uh, you're not allowed to uh right on the Torah scroll. Uh, the way we have our Bibles where we might underline a text that's significant to us and we want to remember, we'll write a note to us, that's forbidden according to rabbinic law on writing on the text. Uh, if you have a Bible and you use it as a, uh, a means for your coffee cup or you place another book on it, that is a sin. Uh, you're putting, you're, de you're defaming the word of God. God's word should be always on the top. Nothing should come on top of God's word. So in just the traditions and rules that they have, there is a high esteem for the word of God, which, by the way, parallels what is spoken about in Deuteronomy uh, 28 and specifically in, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, how the word of God is near unto us. Uh, it's 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 accessible to us and it's holy. So uh, Simchat Torah is a joyous, wonderful day. Um, so what is the significance for us as believers? Well, in uh, John chapter one, an incredible passage. Uh, oftentimes people will say uh, as they introduce Jesus to someone who uh, doesn't know him as savior. One of the tools we use is uh, the book of John, the gospel of John. Uh, and oftentimes uh, you can get just the book of John. Many churches offer them and, and we'll pass them out to people, a, a great thing. Uh, and we just say, well, this is, this is a simple book. Uh, you can read this and see who Jesus is and it's all true. But I submit to you that John chapter one is an amazingly Jewish chapter. It's amazing because it addresses the Jewish people and the scholars of their day because of the word logos. Uh, in the beginning was the word logos is that word. And in Aramaic, there's another word called memra. And memra was a word kind of uh, the best way to describe it is the italics that we have in our translations you know in your bible if you see a verse and the word is italicized you know that that word was not part of the original it was added in order to help you understand the the text 
because the Greek literal translation becomes more chopped and it's harder. It doesn't flow as well. So the translators take the liberty and they let you know uh, by italicizing the word. Well, that's not a unique invention. Uh, when the Jewish people were outside the land and Hebrew became uh, their second language, Aramaic was the first language for many of them. They have these texts that were translated and they often inserted the word memra. And that word explained a lot of the personal um, manifestations of God in the Old Testament. For in instance, the captain of the Lord's army or the way the how God created the heavens and the earth. And so in John chapter one, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's talking to two groups of people. It's talking to the Gentile intellectuals who were uh, uh, regarding knowledge as very high, the Stoics, uh, that covered them. And it also covered the word logos, covered uh, the Jewish people as well, because that's the same word as memory. All that to say, if I've confused you, I'm sorry. Uh, if you have any questions about that, be sure to put it in the box, uh, in the chat box, and I'll try to answer it. But nonetheless, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus manifested himself, incarnated, because in verse 14, it tells us that that word logos, or memra, became flesh. And as John testifies, not only did he become flesh, but we actually saw his glory. And he did, as you read Matthew chapter uh, 17, you see that happen. And so uh, tabernacles, is the, that's the same place where Jesus tabernacled with his people. Uh, it, it's an amazing truth that Jewish people remember tabernacles or Sukkot as one of the, the feasts, the last one, as a reminder of God's provision. But now Jesus is tabernacling with his people. He is actually tenting with them as he became flesh. And of course, John had that opportunity to see him. And we know what Peter said in Matthew, where he said, first of all, when, when Jesus unzipped his glory uh, and he saw Moses and Elijah, Peter said, hey, we'll build you a booth. We'll build a sukkah for you. And the text says, while he was yet speaking, uh, I can relate to Peter quite a bit uh, in that Peter spoke first and then thought about what he already said. And in the text in Matthew, you see that he it says while he was still talking, he was talking a mile a minute. Many Jewish people do that. And while he did that, God, the father says, listen to my son. This is my son. <laughs> and so he, in essence, said, uh, Peter, shut up and, and, and listen. <laughs> this is my son. So anyway, uh, and then the water, the water uh, in John chapter seven, on the last day, Shimoni Esret, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So you've read, if you're reading John chapter 7, you know that it was the uh, eighth day, seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, the eighth day. And during that time, there was the water libation that went on. And it was in the background of Tabernacles that Jesus is saying, remember the water libation? They go, they have a big procession. They pour the water from the golden censers and there's the light in the background. It's a big to-do. And what does Jesus say? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And then he said, I am the light of the world. Now, a lot of times you'll hear this verse used by uh, people like us from Friends of Israel and use it for Hanukkah. It's really used 
uh, in the backdrop of tabernacles. And so in John chapter eight, we see you, if you can picture four big candelabras, the light reflecting on the gold, and Jesus is there saying, hey, I just want to tell you, I am the light of the world. I am the light of light. You, If you're walking in darkness, you can be light. You can have the light of life, and it comes from me. So how do we ap apply what all these things together? Let me just break it down um, so that we can walk away from these three weeks that we've had together and kind of grab hold of the application. The last feast of the seven feasts that God gives is a time where the fulfillment of what Zechariah was teaching. Uh, and in Zechariah, let me turn there to help us through this. In Zechariah chapter uh, 14 and verse 16, it says this, And it shall come to pass that every that everyone who is left of all nations which came unto Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts on them, there will be no rain. So in the millennial kingdom, there is going to be a celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. In Zechariah 8 and verse 23, just a couple of uh, pages back, it says this, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, this will be in the millennial kingdom again, 10 men from every language of the nations. And by the way, they will be required in the millennium to come to Jerusalem. 10 men of every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. So uh, Zechariah tells us that the Jewish people are going to be front and center exactly the way God intended for them to be um, when he promised uh, and chose them as the nation to model the holiness and righteousness of God. And then in, in uh, chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look at me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn. In God's program, whereas there's only a remnant, small remnant of Jewish people who believe, even though God chose them as a nation, Jesus is Jewish. He's the Jewish Messiah. They are blind to who he is as a whole. There will be a day when the nation will recognize him. And Paul says in Romans chapter 11 and verse 26, all Israel will be saved. And in that day, uh, the millennial kingdom will, will happen because the king will return and he will set up uh, his throne in Jerusalem. And he will be as he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And these seven feasts, epitomize that program the crown jewel of them all is the last one where the program of god is instituted and it's a blessing i think uh to see how god has told his story through the jewish people what's what is also amazing is that not inserted in those seven feasts are you and me now i'm jewish most of you are gentile but when I say you and me, we're part of the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was a unknown factor to the Old Testament saints. There wasn't any knowledge of that. The church is a mystery. And so here God has provided a, a, a gap, just like he outlined in Daniel chapter 9. This gap uh, between the 69th week and the 70th week, and during this time, God is 
is really gathering the church, a group of people uh, where the middle wall of partition is broken, Jew and Gentile together, recognizing the Jewish Messiah as Savior and Lord of the world. And we don't know how long he's been gathering it. So far, it's been 2,000 years or a couple of days, if you regard a day as a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years as a day. So it's a couple days, uh, but he's gathering his bride for uh, a time when he'll call us to meet him in the air and finish the program that he promised with his chosen people. So I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, spend time with you like this.